Hammond, uh, Mr. Eppleman, telling stories of transformation. I can't say that word. Yeah. <laughs> I should let you talk. Hey, Diffraction and autoethnography. Thank you, Craig. All right, thank you. All right, uh, morning, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to embark on the probably impossible task of trying to talk about three things. So um, aspects of my work. Uh, and then some kind of new concepts such as hexiety uh, that I'm working on. And then also how I'm trying to incorporate these in a decolonial sense in, in relation to pedagogy and practice. Uh, so uh, these are aspects of my writing. So this isn't just an ego trip to talk about the work that I've written so far, although that is part of it, being an academic. Uh, so it, Mr. Airport Man and the Albatross. Uh, so that is a chapter that is uh, due to be published this month. And it's a piece of autoethnographic work based on my uh, working class, white working class male heritage. Uh, largely focused on the 1970s and 1980s in kind of northwest Blackburn, where I grew up. Uh, prior to that, in Hope, Utopia and Creativity, I'd written a chapter called Bye Bye Badman, which for those of you that are fans of the Stone Roses will know that that is a song by the Stone Roses. And again, uh, it goes into my heritage of kind of leaving school with no qualifications and joining the army and kind of making the transition to, to where I've become, uh, you know, today, which is an academic, which, which compared to people from my background, that's an unorthodox kind of journey. So the kind of things that I tap into are, I've mentioned also ethnography, so personal creative writing. And in relation to Mr. Airport Man, uh, music, daydreaming, imagination, uh, uh, and basically flight and becoming obsessed with Manchester Airport as well, which uh, I haven't really got time to go into that, but so you'll have to read the chapter. <laughs> so moving on from that, uh, so I'm... I'm kind of developing this this connection to autoethnography, um, memory work, um, biography work, uh, and music. So I'm I'm hoping to move on to write this book called Souvenirs from the Infirmary, an autoethnography of music, memory, and escape. Um, where the infirmary comes into it. So the area that I grew up with, uh, in Blackburn was called the infirmary area because it was built around Blackburn Royal Infirmary, which which no longer exists. Uh, and again, very kind of working class uh, background. Um, now, why am I talking about this, you might ask? Well, music uh, has played really quite an important part in my life. Um, so I'm just going to move on to the next slide, because as part of this work, I'm also writing about Oedipus, you know, so Sophocles work. Uh, Oedipus the King, so some people he's play. Um, so what I'm not doing with with Oedipus is putting in place a kind of literal translation of the play. So I'm, I'm adapting the kind of names and the characters um, from Oedipus. Um, I'm also quite interested in tracing back the etymology of words and terms. So Oedipus is interesting because it actually translates as swollen foot. Uh, because as the story goes in Oedipus, uh, a prophecy was spoken over Oedipus's life that he would uh, kill his father and marry his mother. So his birth parents, in order to prevent this prophecy coming true, they bound his ankles as a child to try and stop him crawling, moving and, and growing uh, you know, to try to stop this, this happening. Now, I think this is quite a powerful metaphor, certainly thinking about my working class heritage. Um, because being brought up in a white working class family, extended family, neighbourhood, the kind of characteristics that I would nurture into were what we would today refer to as toxic masculinity, uh, misogyny, um, violence, racism, anti-learning, anti-academic, and uh, certainly where men were concerned, emotional repression. Um, now, also in, in Oedipus, uh, the the figure of the Sphinx is uh, written about, which is another concept that I'm adapting um, because Oedipus sets off on his 
journey to try to find out who he is and um, to kind of make sense of his life. Uh, and he encounters a sphinx who poses a riddle to him. And if he doesn't, if he didn't solve the riddle, then the sphinx would kill him. Um, ultimately, Oedipus uh, solves the riddle. Um, however, I'm using that term slightly differently again because I trace back the etymology of sphinx, and it's sphincter, uh, which is to again means to bind tight to control. Uh, and my experience of school uh, was. Um, Challenging, shall we say. Now, I did enjoy school, uh, but academically, I, I did really quite abysmally um, because it was based on kind of principles and values and, and ideas were communicated in ways that just didn't make any sense to me. Um, so it was I was kind of the, the, the options were that I, I, I was kind of I was either bound. I was either bound by the kind of parameters of school and education, which ultimately I wasn't because I railed against it. But the upshot of that was that I failed uh, terribly. Um, so there you go. So Oedipus and the Sphinx. Oedipus being bound by a kind of working class heritage based on these characteristics. And Sphinx, a kind of organized, organizational sphincter that schools and education was based on. So those two things came together, which meant that I just didn't succeed uh, in school. Um, but... As you've probably noticed, uh, <laughs> I am stood here today as uh, an academic, so I'm, I'm a reader in the School of Education, uh, recently awarded a National Teaching uh, Fellowship. So something changed. Um, and, and this is where the autobiographic writing comes in. Um, so what I've had to do in a decolonial sense, I had to decolonize my heritage. Uh, now, from, from the kind of limited research that I've conducted, uh, decolonization and then decolonizing the curriculum across various universities tends to focus in the main, not exclusively, but it tends to focus on race and ethnicity. Um, now, there was a blog recent, re, re, written recently by somebody called Hack or Advance HE, which was called something like Decolonization A Conversation. Uh, and she was basically saying we need to extend this notion of decolonization out. Uh, and, and sort of problematize it because it's it's got to be we've got to incorporate social class into this. Uh, and for me, so, you know, my background is white working class masculinity. Now, I'm, I, it, th these are problematic conversations. They're not easy conversations, but nevertheless, I think they're still important conversations that we need to have because still those type of lads from those type of backgrounds you look at any kind of educational statistic and they are the worst performing group you know when it comes to qualifications and educational success so there's for me i think there is work there that we, we need to do which then takes me on to um some of the concepts that i'm working on so what i'm interested in doing is not only decolonizing my past and decolonizing my heritage but also decolonizing the curriculum and pedagogy in the university. So using autoethnography and memory and uh, transformative experiences through engaging with knowledge in different ways, uh, I've started to work on these concepts, hoxiety, which I'll say a little bit about if I've got time, and diffraction. So what is hoxiety? It's not a term that really just rolls off the tongue. Uh, <laughs> well, strangely enough, it's a concept that I, I, I kind of discovered through the philosophers Deleuze and Guattari. Uh, and it's actually traces, it, we trace back to Duns Scotus, who is a medieval scholastic philosopher. Uh, and hexiety, again, actually translates as this or thisness, as opposed to quiddity, which is whatness. So, it, so it's kind of specific versus the general. And hexiety relates to the unique interiority of each and every individual person. Um, one minute. Uh, so, for example, with music, you encounter a song. We can all listen to that song, but what it actually means for you as an individual is really quite unique uh, and, and unpredictable and chaotic. Uh, so this is one of the concepts I'm kind of incorporating into my pedagogic practice in order to kind of break down the parameters of pedagogy and curriculum control. And the mechanism that I'm using to get students to practice 
this this notion of hexity is through diffractive writing. Uh, so diffraction again relates to kind of fragmentation, fracture to splinter. Um, uh, so for the students that engage in my modules, it's not a case of me standing at the front and teaching them about these concepts, but I do introduce them to them. But it's really about them engaging with them and practicing these concepts and, and kind of interpreting what they mean for them, which then sets them off on their own kind of respective uh, journeys of life, writing uh, and so on and so forth. So to draw things to a close in this kind of 10 minute whistle stop tour of some really quite complex concepts. Uh, so, um, so knowledge can be decolonized through hexity and diffractive writing. Uh, and, and so the, I've kind of in, I've put this in place with dissertations. So I've had students that have worked on these concepts and also on one of my MA modules, critique power and transformation in education. So I'm starting to roll these pedagogic principles out uh, as well. There you go.